there, I'm Paul and welcome to the night sky in November when the nights are drawing in. First of all, let's talk about a few things that uh, we're doing uh, on the internet. Yeah? Um, because of COVID-19, of course, we don't have regular meetings um, uh, actually in Queen's University as normal, but we are doing a lot on Zoom. So uh, Wednesday, the 4th of November, 7.30 sharp, we have Professor Alan Fitzsimmons from Queen's University. Uh, what makes a comet great? And that's well worth uh, looking forward to. Then two weeks later, on the 18th of November, Wednesday the 18th of November, 1930, uh, Dr. Yorick Vink from Armagh Observatory and Planetarium will join us for a session, 30 Years of Hubble, Opening the Treasure Chest. And just uh, in December, just to give you advance warning of that one, 2nd of December, 1930, we've uh, Professor Katrina Jackman from uh, the Dublin Institute of Advanced Studies, Adventures in the Outer Solar System, the Cassini Mission, and more. That sounds absolutely fantastic. The, all of these are uh, done via Zoom and simulcast on our YouTube channel. So you get the uh, details on our website, um, irishastro.org. Uh, and there's a link on there, the red button, to our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com user slash Irish astronomy slash videos. And you'll see actually that, um, that the previous lectures of the season are also available on there. OK, so coming to our customary look at the sun, this is a couple of days ago, October the 28th. And there is a sunspot group on the sun, um, active region 2778. And we see also that uh, this was 71% when we last looked at it, and I think it was 74% the time before that, the number of days without sunspots in 2020. Um, so far 204, which is 68% of all days. Um, so that's uh, dropping there. Let's have a little look, at, closer look at uh, this. This is, the, this is the magnetogram view of active region 2778. And we see that from the polarity of this, we can determine that this is very definitely um, a sunspot of solar cycle 25. 24, I think, is completely dead and gone now. We won't see any more sunspots of uh, solar cycle 24. It's all 25 from here on in. And, uh, and they're becoming a bit more frequent. So, uh, so things are building up again on the sun. This is a great time of the year to be looking at the planets. Um, we saw quite a few in October. Um, November is slightly better even in that we see Mercury as well. Um, Jupiter is bright in the south. We'll have a look at Jupiter and Saturn um, and uh, a, a little shortly later then. Very bright um, in the southeast. It, rising in the east before 8 o'clock. Mars. Mars has just passed opposition. It's actually brighter than Jupiter at the moment. Uh, for the early part of the month at least. It's fading a little bit. Um, it won't be this bright again until 2035. Uh, Venus rises 4 o'clock in the morning uh, and is still magnitude minus 4. That's getting closer to the Sun again as it passes around the other side and fading a little bit as it does so. But then you get Mercury. We'll look at Mercury a little bit later. Uh, Mercury can, in theory, be brighter than Sirius at its brightest, um, i.e. brighter than any star, but it's not often seen because it's always quite close to the sun. Uranus you'll need to look at with binoculars or a telescope um, unless you're one of those very gifted people that can see it naked eye. I never have. Magnitude minus 5.7. Neptune you will definitely need a scope and that is in Aquarius at magnitude 7.9. Just, just uh, past opposition in September so still uh, reasonably well visible um, in Aquarius. Now we do have um, a promising comet coming up. This is a southern hemisphere comet, as was, that is now making its way into the northern hemisphere, Comet C2020 M3 Atlas. And you see the path of it here, well, that means it's getting up in quite late at night or early in the morning to see Orion. And it's currently 2nd of November, just coming up past Rigel, and then goes up through Orion up towards Bellatrix by the 15th, 17th. That would be a good time to look because there is no moon on the 15th or thereabouts. Uh, the new moon is the 15th this month. And so that is Comet Atlas, C2020 M3 Atlas, well worth looking out for. 
Now we're celebrating a, a major anniversary of the International Space Station. That, uh, um, it's 20 years today, the 2nd of November, since the, um, the International Space Station has been continuously habited by, um, or inhabited by, by uh, astronauts. Um, and 241 astronauts have been to, uh, to the International Space Station since November 2000, the 2nd of November 2000. Uh, that was the first day on which there's been someone in space ever since. Um, you can see the different countries that have sent people there. Um, one from Great Britain, and uh, here he is. Uh, it's Tim Peake, who's shown here with Tim Copra on the 18th of October 2016 at the Ulster Hall in Belfast. Uh, and they were being interviewed by um, Northern Irish journalist Sarah Travers at that point. Um, very memorable evening, that one. You can see the space station coming past in two distinct uh, phases. First of all, morning passes from the beginning of November right through to the 9th of November. Uh, you have to get up early in the morning to see those, but they're well worth seeing. Um, but the more accessible evening passes start on the 22nd of November. Um, and they go through actually into December um, quite a bit with some very bright passes there, a minus 3.2 magnitude on the 29th of November. Uh, rising to 50 degrees height from, from Belfast and a 51 degree one on the 1st of December magnitude minus 3.1 uh, very well worth seeing there this is the start and finish times of the uh, of the pass this is the highest point um, some of these all of these start from the western horizon but some fade out before they get to the eastern horizon so anything that's not 10 degrees here, for example, this one that's 42 degrees, that fades out uh, actually at the top of its path um, at 1842 on the 26th of November there. So heavensabove.com, put your location in there and it give you give you a, a wealth of other information apart from just the ISS. Now we have a, a good meteor shower um, this this time, the 2020, this this um, peaks on the 16th, 17th of November and the radiant where you need to be looking is um, in, the, in the, the sort of the top of the question mark, the backwards question mark of the front end of Leo, Leo the lion. Um, you need to be looking sort of around about midnight or after there and you're not looking directly at the radiant but you're looking around it, the constellations surrounding there and of course and the moon is new on the 15th so um, we should get a very good rendition of the Leonid's meteor shower. Not the most prolific shower, although there are regular outbursts, although we're not sort of expecting one this year, I don't think. Um, but uh, well worth looking out for. The parent comet, i.e. the comet whose tail we're passing through, is 55P Temple Tuttle. that was uh, around a long time ago. So that's uh, the Leonid's meteor shower. So we'll start our tour of November's sky with the um, time set to 7 o'clock. That's a good time to start stargazing now that the clocks have changed. And um, we're on the 2nd of November here. And the first thing we'll notice, looking southwards, two bright planets in the south, Jupiter and Saturn. We'll have a look first at Jupiter. Uh, we'll zoom in to there and see what we get there. We've got uh, Now we've got some nice... Galilean moons, um, three visible. Um, Io looks like it's actually uh, behind Jupiter. Oh no, it's in front of Jupiter at this point. There's Io. Um, and uh, no no great red spot at this point, so we'll see if that comes into view a little later. We'll, we'll, we'll step this forward an hour at a time. Um, and that's the shadow of Io has become apparent at, uh, um, at 8 o'clock. It's setting, unfortunately. Jupiter sets not very long after this. Um, but there we are, that's it setting just after 8 o'clock in the evening. So you need to see Jupiter early on. OK, so that's Jupiter. Now moving a little to the east, we see Saturn a little higher up than Jupiter at this point. And we'll come back to the earlier time. There we are, that's better. And we'll zoom in on Saturn. Now Titan is nicely visible to the west of Saturn. Um, Titan is about eight and a half magnitude or so, 8.7 uh, there, and uh, can quite easily be seen in a, in a modest telescope. Um, never seen it in binoculars, but uh, 
um, certainly or, or actually with a with a camera with a long lens on we will get Titan um, but coming back to Saturn itself now Saturn is well past opposition and we see this by the fact that there's a large shadow of the body of Saturn on its rings that is because um, we're no longer in line with the Sun that the Sun is actually somewhere off to uh, to the west and is casting its shadow definitely to one side of Saturn here um, there's Saturn spectacular sight um, best seen with at least 30 times magnification so binoculars doesn't quite do it um, binoculars being 10 or 15 times you will probably see that Saturn is not round um, but you won't actually see the rings as a distinct thing 30 plus magnification so small telescopes are, um, because it's not you don't need big light gathering for Saturn it's quite bright um, but uh, uh, you do need magnification to see those rings Now, while we're looking south, we do see uh, still a good proportion of the Milky Way. We obviously don't get the same Milky Way they get in the Southern Hemisphere, where they're looking right into the centre of the galaxy, but we do get quite a nice Milky Way um, at this time of year, and quite a good few objects in it particularly as well. Um, um, clusters, wild duck cluster, the clouds of Scutum, and then looking further up, this time of year is a very good time of year, strangely, to see the summer triangle um, nice and early in the evening and you've got the uh, uh, the three main stars of the summer triangle here Deneb, Vega, Altair all in that southern sky uh, there's a wealth of objects in that area I'm going to focus in on one of my favorite ones here um, every astronomer has favorite things and I have a favorite star and this is it here Albireo, Beta Cygni and we'll have a close look in and see what's attractive about that. You need to look at this. Again, a small telescope is perfectly adequate to show um, this. It is a beautiful binary star and what Stellarium here isn't showing us is the wonderful colour contrast. Um, the, the main star is gold and the lesser star is a beautiful sapphire blue. It's a lovely sight in a telescope. So that's um, Beta Cygni. Now, looking towards the great square of Pegasus here, this is uh, very easily recognisable in the southeastern sky at the moment. Um, Alpha Aret's there, which is actually um, Alpha Andromeda, and these other stars here forming this square. Um, one interesting item that often gets overlooked because it's not quite so uh, dramatic as, as um, the great cluster in Hercules, but um, Messier 15 is a nice one, uh, the Pegasus cluster here. Uh, magnitude 6.3, so not quite um, naked eye visible, um, but in binoculars you'll see, and in a, in a, even a small telescope again, it's a it's a pretty good sight. It's a lovely globular, um, and there it is. That's uh, that's M15, looking very good. Um, in in Pegasus. Now, let's go back to that great square, and we'll do a, the standard star hop here. You take the top two of the square of Pegasus and remember that distance in your mind then you come along here to the to the top left corner and take a slight right turn and go the same distance again you'll come to a star there called Mirac stop at Mirac do a 90 degree right turn and go a short distance till you come to the next star which is a not very bright star called Mu Andromeda and then you go exactly the same distance again and there's a fuzzy patch that you'll see in the sky there and that is Messier 31 um, the Andromeda galaxy it's actually the furthest away thing you can see with the naked eye um, that's giving magnitude here is 3.44 I've always thought it's more fourth magnitude but there we go um, and it's got its two satellite galaxies here Messier 32 which is not quite so obvious there and the, the obvious one is Messier 110 uh, and that's there and, and actually what you've got to realize about this is the sheer size of it when you see it through a telescope you only see that core there as a fuzzy patch but actually when you start taking pictures and you get the, the spiral arms here and whatever um, that is four or five moons end to end there um, diameters uh, about sort of three degrees or so so it really is um, um, it really is um, a very huge thing in the sky. If it was brighter, it would be fantastic. 
um, but it's not that bright so you don't see anything other than the bright core of it usually. Now then going back to the great square of Pegasus and looking downwards from there um, it's absolutely easy to see the planet Mars because it's at the brightest it will be now until the year 2035. It's just gone past opposition and is fading a little bit um, but still um, at the beginning of the month brighter than Jupiter at magnitude minus 2.1. Uh, let's zoom in on Mars and have a little look at it. Mars is often disappointingly small in a telescope, it just is. Um, however, you can see at the moment a little bit of the icy south pole. It doesn't show on this, but uh, um, but that is shrinking because it actually is the Martian summer um, in its southern hemisphere at the moment, and so the uh, and so the, uh, the the CO2 um, becomes gaseous um, at that point um, and doesn't show up as an ice cap. Um, two moons. Phobos and Deimos, fear and dread. Um, very, very difficult to see in a telescope. There are people who have managed to photograph those two moons um, and what you need to end up doing is, is the same as you would when trying to photograph exoplanets. You have to put something in front of the scope to blot out the brightness of Mars because Mars at minus 2.1 completely blots out these guys. They're about 12th magnitude. Um, so uh, let's have a look there. Phobos actually 10.97 and Deimos 12.06. So so it's 12, 11th and 12th magnitudes. Um, the two moons of Mars. Now looking further west still, um, we see the two stars. They're quite distinctive because there's not much else around them. Um, the two stars of uh, Aries, Hamal, and Sheratan, and they sort of form. Um, this sort of isosceles triangle almost with planet Uranus down here. Now let's go and uh, see if we can find that. Okay, now Uranus, some people say they can see this naked eye. Um, it's magnitude 5.7, so it's just about theoretically possible. I have never seen it naked eye. Um, but uh, in a telescope, small telescope, it shows up quite nicely as a green blob. And actually, if we zoom in closer, we can even see sort of five of the main moons of Uranus. Um, absolutely no chance of seeing its ring system there. That was only discovered in the 1980s uh, that it had a ring system at all. So uh, there's there's Uranus. Okay, now looking towards the middle of the month where there is no moon, we can look at some deep sky objects. Um, Starting, start, starting to look north and we can see the plough is right in the north here with the uh, three stars of the handle and then the big dipper and of course we find north by taking the two stars uh, Dubia Merak, the pointers and if we imagine five times the distance between them continue that line up and we come to Polaris, the pole star not the brightest star in the sky as some say um, actually a very average second magnitude star um, but very nice all the same. Now we'll go back to the plough and we'll take the dipper here and we'll take the two opposite corner stars of the dipper and we memorize that distance and then we go the same distance again and then we zoom in and we will come to a lovely pair of galaxies well worth having a look at through a if you look at a sort of sort of eight inch reflector would you get a great view of these two um something like that and if we zoom in we do get uh, pictures now that's uh, messier 81 and messier 82 messier 82 has a huge amount of hydrogen alpha um, red color to it if you've got a camera that's good with hydrogen alpha and some are um, then that uh, looks particularly spectacular um, the Bode's galaxy and that's a cigar galaxy up there, the M82, so that's uh, well worth looking at. Now coming back to Ursa Major and following those pointers up to Polaris and continuing beyond, we will eventually come up to Cassiopeia and we're into the Milky Way there. And there's an absolute wealth of deep sky objects well worth having a look at in the Cassiopeia region. Let's pick a pick a couple. First of all, we'll start here with Messier 52. Let's let's go and have a look at this. It's a uh, it's a lovely cluster, the salt and pepper cluster, some call it. 
and there we are looks sort of looks like a pepper pot doesn't it with a, a salt hole in it as well um, so that's Messier 52 but perhaps more interesting next to that is NGC 7635 the bubble nebula so let's go and have a look at that one um, I think we can see where they're getting the bubble from there that's a that's a glorious sight again mostly hydrogen alpha if you've got a hydrogen alpha sensitive camera it will pick out a lot of detail in that if you haven't don't worry um, but uh, cameras do vary on this and uh, um, you can actually get them modified as well to have the uh, the filter removed that causes that problem um, so there we go let's have another look here that's uh, we're in Cassiopeia let's go to the other end of Cassiopeia and famously the double cluster here which is in the top end of Perseus let's zoom in there that's always worth a look the two 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 gravitationally linked clusters um, and uh, a lot of colorful stars in it as well and if we just zoom out a little bit we get this um, string of pearls as it's called here that uh, emanates from the cluster so that's a bit of a brief trip around the sky for november we'll come back with more of the winter sky in december okay so that's all i've got to say for now other than stay safe keep looking up and thanks for watching